Beloved people of God, this is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. For those gathered live virtually and those who will worship through this recording, welcome to Faith Lutheran Church's worship service. This morning, my name is Jane Baker, and I have the privilege of serving this community of Faith Lutheran Church. Just a few notes about the service. Um, we will be celebrating Holy Communion this morning, and I hope uh, you all join us in doing that. So make sure that you have a bit of bread and a sip of either wine or grape juice ready. If you are with someone else this morning, please serve each other the bread and the wine. If you are alone, then please commune at the time that I do. During the live service, if you have a prayer request, then please go ahead and uh, type it into the chat box, and then I will include it in the prayers of the people. Thank you all for faithfully sending in your tithes and your offerings to support the mission and ministry of, of Faith Lutheran Church. Um, if you're new to faith, um, what we most hope for is that you'll connect with us um, via our website or social media. If you'd like more information about Faith Lutheran Church, then please contact me through our church website at faithroseburg.org. For now, everyone is muted. At certain points in the service, um, we'll ask you to unmute yourself during those times. If you are experiencing noise in your home or if you need to step away, then please go ahead and mute yourself while you do that. So we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our welcome statement. We are a church that shares a living, daring confidence in God's grace. Liberated by our faith, we embrace everyone as a whole person with questions, doubts, complexities, and all. We are moved by God's grace to welcome all who have ever felt marginalized, no matter your gender identity, sexual orientation, age, race, ethnicity, marital status, or faith background. We welcome you as we worship, learn, and share Christ's love together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Let us confess together. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are corrupted by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Siblings in Christ, we are God's children and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, your sins are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. So let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. The first reading this morning is from the prophet Amos, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 18. Alas, for you who are who desire the day of the Lord, why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. The offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters. 
and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 1 through 13. Jesus said to the disciples, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the right wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came along also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I have been participating in the Oregon Synod Assembly this week, the message today comes from Reverend Amy Starr Redwine of First Presbyterian Church in Richmond, Virginia. And she will be basing her sermon on the passage from the prophet Amos that you just heard. So we give thanks for her witness this morning. During the Great Depression, it was a challenge for many Americans to make ends meet, much less be able to give anything away to others in need. In the Appalachian Mountains, Presbyterian churches came up with a program called God's Acre, through which families were encouraged to set aside the income of one acre of their land to the work of the church. A Presbyterian minister I know grew up in a large family on one of those Appalachian farms and participated in the God's Acre program. One day, a reporter writing an article about the program came to take a picture of his family with their pigs. The father and nine of the children were slopping the pigs and doing other work on the farm when they were called together for the picture. Some were so dirty, you could hardly tell where their clothes ended and their skin began. The picture was taken, the reporter left, and the family went back to work. Years later, this minister was asked to speak at a church supper. Before he spoke, there was a slide presentation on the Appalachian poor. A succession of pictures of people in miserable situations was projected on the screen as a speaker added some commentary. Suddenly, to my friend's shock and horror, there on the screen flashed a picture of his filthy family standing in a pig pen. No one made the connection except him, of course, but he was mortified. Until that moment when the slide flashed on the screen, my friend had never thought of himself as having been poor. His family was no worse off than most of their neighbors, so why would he? Long ago, there was a community that did not think of themselves as poor. They came to a new land and on their farms there, they made a decent living. They had a tight community and considered everyone family. They called their land the promised land, and they said that it flowed with milk and honey, even though it really didn't. What mattered to them, though, was that this land was given to them by God. And because they lived for God, which meant living for each other, they knew deep joy and satisfaction. By the time of the prophet Amos, 
This poor but joyful community of people was known as the nation of Israel. And Israel's fortunes had changed for the better. Damascus, which had been ruling the Middle East by bullying smaller nations, was finally in decline, having been conquered by Assyria. This meant that finally there was room for some expansion by smaller nations. Israel got in on the action, establishing trade routes, strengthening its military, creating new businesses. Unfortunately, the unprecedented prosperity and security that followed led to an increase in greed and injustice. These people that had once seen themselves as a family started sorting out into rich and poor. And as so often happens, the wealthy few seemed to keep getting wealthier while the poor kept getting poorer often because of the ways the wealthy cheated them. But in the midst of all of this, everyone continued to worship God and to do all the things the members of this family of faith were supposed to do to show their gratitude, respect, and reverence to the one who had given them the land. Enter the prophet Amos. Amos had a message to deliver from Israel's God, and it wasn't job well done. Instead, the message Amos delivers from God is this, watch out, because the day of the Lord is coming, and it is not going to be what you expect. Today, we might associate the day of the Lord with the second coming of Jesus, but this was back before the first coming. The day of the Lord was not the end times. It was the time when God was going to get involved with humanity in a whole new way and set things right once and for all. But according to Amos, the Israelites, especially the wealthy ones, were in for a nasty surprise when the day of the Lord finally arrived. And this is just the beginning of the bad news Amos has for Israel. Because not only is the future not going to be what they expect, but they've got some messed up ideas about the present as well. They think they know exactly how to worship God with the right kinds of grain offerings and animal sacrifices with their anthems and harp music. But according to Amos, God wants nothing to do with it. God has no interest in their worship, no matter how closely they follow the laws of ritual and sacrifice. And God has no interest because, according to Amos, unless your actions outside of worship reflect your actions during worship, you may as well not bother. Unless our everyday lives line up with our theology, with the God we profess in worship, it turns out we don't need to bother with worship at all. Years ago, the great theologian William Sloan Coffin was on a political talk show with Henry Kissinger while Kissinger was Secretary of State. At one point in their conversation, Coffin said to Kissinger, Henry, you have to remember what the Old Testament says Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Kissinger responded, how are we supposed to do that? Coffin replied, it's my job to say it. It's your job to figure out the irrigation system. Maybe you've seen the image that has popped up in a number of places lately. It shows a pair of street signs showing the intersection of faith, and politics. And it is often used to introduce an article or a webinar discussing exactly what that intersection is. Well, Amos reminds us here that to think of faith and politics as two different pathways of life that occasionally intersect is to get it all wrong. Because faith 
is supposed to be the thing that propels us out of the church and into the community, where we are each called to find ways to irrigate our daily lives and our communities with the waters of justice and righteousness. According to Amos, unless we live for God by living for others, what we do in church doesn't matter at all. Will Willimon was once the pastor of a small church in a changing neighborhood. The church had long been losing members, and so they decided it was time to embark on a new effort of evangelism. One Sunday after worship, a handful of brave souls gathered together, and Willimon heard someone tell two elderly women, Sarah and Mary, to go down Summit Street, turn right, and start knocking on doors. A couple of hours later, after many discouraging conversations, the band of evangelists returned to the church and shared their stories. People hadn't answered their doors. Others hadn't wanted to talk about church. Others already had a church home and weren't interested in hearing about a new one. Then in walked Sarah and Mary, breathless and excited. We went down Summit, they said, and then we turned left and started knocking on doors. Hey, wait a minute. Willimon interrupted. You were supposed to go down Summit and then turn right, not left. Yeah, someone else chimed in. You weren't supposed to go into that neighborhood. That's the projects. Well, anyway, Mary and Sarah went on. There were lots of people who didn't answer doors or who weren't interested, but there was this one lady, Verlene. She came to the door and she had two little kids and we told her about our church and she said she was just desperate. And we told her that was just the kind of person we needed at our church. We invited her to come to the Wednesday morning ladies' Bible study. Mary and Sarah were beaming, but everyone else looked skeptical. What about the kids? Someone asked. Well, we told her to bring them, they said. We, we said we'd provide child care. And sure enough, on Wednesday morning, Verlene showed up at the church, kids in tow. The Bible study that day was about temptation. And after they had read the Bible passage, Willimon asked the women to share about a time they had faced temptation. At first, no one spoke. Then one woman told about going to the grocery store the day before and discovering in the parking lot that she had a loaf of bread in her bag she hadn't paid for. At first, I wasn't going to do anything about it, she said. I mean, really, is one loaf of bread going to make or break that big store? But I knew I had to do the right thing, so I went back and returned it. Everyone around the table nodded their approval. Then Verlene spoke up. Well, there was this one time she started. I was living with this guy, not the father of my second child, but the man before that, and we were doing a lot of coke, you know, and that stuff, it really messes with your head. And one day we needed some cash, and he talked me into robbing this little service station. And we went in and he put a gun to the man's head and we made out with about $200, easy as taking candy from a baby. But something about it just didn't feel right to me. Then a few weeks later, he came up with another plan to rob a convenience store and I thought about it and I just couldn't do it. I told him, no, I'm not going to do it. And he beat the hell out of me. But that was the first time in my life I said no to anybody about anything. It was the first time in my life I felt like somebody. And Willimon said, well, okay, I think it's time for us to pray now. Later in the parking lot, Mary said to Willimon, your Bible study just got a whole lot more interesting. I'm going to go home and get on the phone because I think we can get people there. I mean, this is good. This is good stuff. Willimon said, look, You were told to go down Summit and turn right, not left. And Mary said, Pastor, I am as bored with this church as you are. I think Verlene was sent to us by God to remind us what the gospel is really about. One of the things the last eight months of living through a global pandemic has taught us 
is that most of us, regardless of location or denomination, had become pretty attached to the ways we worship. For the most part, we had control over our worship. We planned for it, rehearsed for it, made sure on Sunday mornings that everything in the sanctuary was polished and perfect and ready to go. The bulletins and the flowers, the envelopes and the offering plates. Then the unthinkable happened, and we could no longer gather in our sanctuaries. And whether your church is back together now or continuing to worship at a distance, we all learned something from that experience. And hopefully what we learned was the very thing Amos was trying to teach the Israelites who had become so complacent in their worship and in their living. And it was the same thing Verlene taught Will Willimon's church, that God expects more from God's people than worship that is predictable and controlled and polished to perfection. God expects worship to inspire us to create the community God had in mind when God created humanity and called us into life together. It is the community Jesus teaches about in parables and sermons, what he calls the kingdom of God. God expects that kingdom to be filled with people whose worship inspires them to be conduits of the mighty waters of justice and righteousness, to live the faith that we profess, to live for God by living for others. The question, of course, is how? And to that question, there are no easy answers. But throughout the Bible, from the Hebrew prophets to Jesus and the first apostles, we catch these glimpses of a community that invites people to focus on we instead of me. Depending on your particular situation, this could look drastically different. But this is something Amos desperately wanted God's people to recognize. That when we give in to the temptation of focusing on my needs and my desires, my family safety and security, my comfort, rather than considering the needs of the whole community, even of those I don't know, even of those I don't like, even of those who voted differently than we did. When we give in to the temptation to focus on me instead of on we, there is a deep disconnect between the God we worship and the God of our daily lives. According to the prophet Amos, what God wants most for us is to let go, to cling just a little less tightly to our security, our comfort, our money, our time, our opinions, even our ways of worship that we cherish so deeply. God longs for us to dive in to the rushing waters of justice and righteousness to let ourselves be led by the Holy Spirit, to live for God by attending to the deep and urgent needs of our fellow human beings. Unless we do this, our worship rings hollow. It is simply not pleasing to God. But when our worship propels us, to be bearers of justice and compassion and mercy in a world that desperately needs them. When we live for God by living for each other, we might just catch a glimpse of God's kingdom, the kingdom Jesus promised is always within our reach. Amen.
As you seek your fame, the meek are left trampled beneath your feet. As you hoard your wealth, the poor from whom you steal will in the street. Your worship comes as empty noise clanging in my ears. What good to me your fancy feasts dry your brother's tears. And let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like an always present ever-flowing stream. The voice of God cries out to us, you have so much to give. Seek good and flee from evil. How else can you live? So let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like an always present a flowing stream. like an always present ever flowing stream As we gather separately and yet together in spirit, let us pray for the needs of the world, responding to each petition with the words, God, hear our prayer. Gracious creator, ruler of the universe, we know neither the day nor the hour Christ shall return to claim the faithful. Through your saving and sustaining grace, you give us your hope as we wait amidst the hardships, anxieties, and uncertainties of this world. Enable us to remain in readiness and to welcome your appearing. And together we say, God, God hear God. our prayer. Protective creator, be with all observing Veterans Day, Veterans Day this week. Guard the lives of active duty and retired military personnel. Comfort all who mourn those who have died in the line of duty heal the wounds, both physical and mental, experienced by service members, and together we say, God, hear our prayer. Eternal creator, author of unity, help us to avoid demonizing those who do not think like us. In this polarizing time, give us eyes to see as you see us. Remove the barriers that separate us, Christian from Christian, red states from blue states, friend from friend, family member from family member. Help President-elect Joe Biden bring our nation together. Help each of us to bind up our nation's wounds. And together we say, God, hear our prayer. Restoring Creator, we thank you for the privilege of voting and having the opportunity to have our voices heard. Regardless of our differences, teach us to evoke real change as we move forward together. Point us to the way that leads to understanding and tolerance of those we deem to be the other side. Let us not forget that we are one nation under you, 
and as your children, we are to seek liberty and justice for all. And together we say, God, hear our prayer. Healing creator, we plead with you to grant healing and wholeness to the sick. Lay upon them your hand of mercy and renew and restore them. We pray especially for Kimberly, for Don and Diane, for Donna B, for D, Amanda B, Lori C, Francie, Dan C, Cookie, Joseph, Richard and Penny, Pat M, Don M, Joan M, Dennis M, and Jenna's baby, Linda's brother and her sister-in-law, Sandra, Nick, Shauna, Ken R, Judy, Becky's mom, and those whose names we call out to you now. Make them whole, healing God. And together we say, God, hear our prayer. Merciful creator, comfort all the families who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. Hold in your gentle embrace all those who have died and who will die this day. And together we say, God, God hear our prayer. Accept the prayers of your people, O oh God. Grant us your peace as we await the complete um, and final <laughs> election, election results of our nation. And let your church be a light and a source of hope to all people around us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Peace of Christ be with you always. Also with you. Let us greet one another with a sign of God's peace. Fine. Go ahead and unmute yourselves. Let me. Peace be to everyone. Hey guys. Peace to everyone. Peace everybody. Peace everybody. Uh, Hi. God bless. Peace. Wow. Look at everybody. Peace. God's peace. Rain. There's rain. Hey. hey guys. Hey, Benny. There's rain. Hey. hey. Peace be with you. Hey, Mr. Peace. Peace. Jane, can you see me now? I can see you. There you are. <laughs> yes. Oh, hey. Hey, Jane, hey. Jane please. Oh. Peace be with you. Peace, peace Jane. Peace, everyone. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them to the, the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give him thanks and praise. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy and great is your majesty of your glory. You You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, and it's given for you, and do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, and it's shed for you, and it's shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin, and do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Send, we pray your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine, that through them we might taste the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We ask this of you, Holy Parent, through Jesus Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Please unmute yourself and let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. The kingdom of the power and the glory of the Lord is ours. Now and forever. Amen. Come to the table of the Lord and receive nourishment for your journey. Please share the body and blood of Christ with the ones you are with using the words, this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. If you are alone, please commune with me. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ and it's shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Receive this blessing, beloved of God. May we go from this place of worship and build an irrigation system that lets justice and righteousness flow. May our lamps always be full and lit so that others may walk in our light as we live in the now and in the not yet. And may we stand with the powerless and always be filled with compassion and mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I have some announcements this morning. If you would like us to send this Zoom link to worship of, to your family members or friends so they can join us, um, please call or uh, request or email that request to Barb, um, and we will include them in, in sending them out the link. Once again, it is time to write our annual Advent devotion book. Um, the title this year is the people, the people Who Walked in Darkness Have Seen a Great Light. Please consider writing a short devotion about how you have seen, felt, or experienced Christ's light during this pandemic time. Perhaps it was through another person lending a hand to help you with something. Maybe you observed an act of kindness that you'd like to share. Maybe it was a time when you were Christ's light for another person. How have you felt Christ walking with you through this dark time? Advent begins on Sunday, November 29th, so we need to get started. We need 27 writers to contribute to this effort. Um, we've had several already uh, sign up. Some have even turned in their devotions already, um, but we need quite a few more. Um, there's an online sign up sheet. So it should have been the link to it in the email that you got on Friday. There's a link to the online sign up. And there's also more information in the newsletter about it. So please consider writing a short devotion, yeah, 250 words, give or take, um, about how you've seen the light of Christ shine in the darkness during this pandemic. And if you'd also write a short daily prayer to go with it. And also this year you may include uh, pictures if you'd like to, to go along with your story. Email your submissions to Barb at the church office. Um, and uh, the deadline, these are important, deadline is November 18th. So we can produce this and have it ready um, by the first day of Advent. There is an outreach committee meeting today at noon. And also ask that you be sure to share the link to this recorded worship service with friends and family and uh, on whatever you use for social media. Go in peace, Christ is with you.